everyone! Welcome back, and I have a guest for the first time ever on Vintage Space, and I'm super excited about it. This is my dear friend, Francis French. Would you like to shamelessly point to your book? Oh, we'll shamelessly <laughs> point to our book, because this is something we worked on together, Apollo Pilot, and I can do this shamelessly because neither of us get any of the money from this. This goes to a <laughs> library program with, for kids. Um, this is the memoir of Apollo 7 pilot, Don Isley, an astronaut who died in 1987, we found his manuscript in his well, widow's did. closet. Yeah. And, and we, we, <laughs> we worked on this book because it needed extra stuff about Apollo. Yes. So Amy did a great chapter in here all about what Apollo was. And then astronaut Don Isley talked about what he did. So it's the memoir of the very first person to ever fly an Apollo mission. Francis, as many of you guys, I've talked about his books before, I'm sure, in kind of other things that I think you should read. He's an expert in all things space history, but more importantly for the purposes of today, he has met a lot of the women that are the, I'm going to say quote unquote Mercury 13, or the women that took the medical test at the Lovelace Clinic that my upcoming book is about. So I thought it'd be really fun to sit down and talk to Francis a little bit today about his experience meeting the women. Because, as you know, I only got to talk to one of them. I got to speak to Janora Jessen for an interview, but you've talked to all of them, almost all of them. So I feel hmm. like we should maybe start with, uh, we should maybe backtrack a little bit about wh when did you first hear the story and what made you want to jump into exploring it? Because I assume that's how you met the women for the first time. The first time I wrote about the Mercury 13 was for a magazine article, and I kind of went with the general story about them, which was these were women who could have been astronauts, they were denied because of their gender. And that's as far as I got with it. And then, because of that, I got to know some of these women, and I got an invite to the very first shuttle launch commanded by a woman. Uh, Eileen Collins, commander of a space shuttle mission back in 1999, invited as many of the historic pioneering women that she could to her own launch. And it was amazing. And most of the living Mercury 13 were there, along with a whole bunch of women pilots from World War II. It was, it was an incredible thing. And that's where I got to actually meet these people. And my idea of the story really started changing when I started talking to them. So was that the first time you met them? You, you didn't work on the story about these women before you actually got to meet them at that launch? So for the magazine article, I got to email them a lot. I got okay. to talk to them on the phone. But as I recall, the first time I'd actually met any of them in person was at a shuttle launch, oh. which is an incredible way of doing it. Yeah. We got invited to the family party the night before. Normally with a mm. shuttle commander, it was always a guy. So it was the wife and kids putting on a party at the local right. Holiday Inn. This time, for the first time ever in history, it's the husband of a shuttle commander yeah. cool. and their daughter <laughs> giving this party. Yeah. And here are all these little old grandmas I mean, literally grandmas, grandmas, you know, the, the blue rinse hair and the pearls. And they look like the most sedate, conservative ladies yeah. you can imagine. They were the most raucous, drinking, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Th it was a very interesting party. I'm looking at all these women going, wow, I can't keep up with these ladies. Yeah. They started that in World War II and they were yeah. still partying. Which is not surprising when you think about the kind of women that they were, that they would have... They were the women that were kind of defying norms, as it were, in the 40s, in the 50s. So why, why would they stop doing that now? I, yeah. I think so. I think you've got women who are not, it's not philosophically, I am a feminist, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, though there may have been some of that. It was more just like, who are these guys to tell me not yeah. to do that? I just want to yeah. do it. I just got on and did it. And most of them have this thing of, I'm just going to go out there and do that. And if yeah. some guy tells me no, I'm going to push him out of my way and keep going. Yeah. Really interesting people. Yeah. It's like, the, well, it's, I like that you use the word people because it's like that idea of, you know, if I, I, I don't ever want to drive a, like a semi truck because that scares me, but people can drive semi trucks. Mm -hmm. I am people. Therefore, I can do that if I want to. So it's kind of the same thing of like, people do that. I am people. I'm going to do that because right. why would I say no? Absolutely. Um, which I love, that's what I love about them and kind of this like, screw it. <laughs> I'm doing it attitude, which is awesome. Oh, you watch these little old ladies and you think they were flying not just jets. I mean, they, they were flying bomber planes, these huge things. And this is bombers like the B-17 that right. did not have hydraulic controls. This is like, you are pulling your, I don't know how to fly a plane, but you are you are using this thing to control your flight surfaces with the power in your body. Yeah, old school sheepskin jackets, yep. um, unpressurized, really cold. Every World War II movie you've yeah. ever seen, replace the guy with a little old lady. Well, there it is. Not an old lady at the time, but it, a little it, lady. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. I was, you know, I was just yeah. looking at these women going, you did that yeah. 50 I, years ago. So. So you, you knew the story before the launch. Right. And you'd met some of the women. So what was your, who did you meet 
So no, Wally no, no, no. Funk was yes. the first woman who really, she was the one who invited me. Eileen Collins invited her right. plus guests. Right. And Wally just filled her guest list up. And it, so it was really nice. The first time I'd ever been to a shuttle launch, it was Shuttle Columbia. I got to admit, it came around the corner, there is, there is a Space Shuttle Columbia sitting on the pad. I, a little tear came out of my eye. I'm like, there is a shuttle yeah. on the launch pad for the very first yeah. time. I'd never seen that. Nice. Now you can see them in museums. At that time, you mm -hmm. saw them operational. Yeah. So got to see a shuttle, got to see an incredible night launch with all those women there. And so what a great introduction your, to these that women. That was your first ever launch? My first ever oh, launch, yeah. Cool. What That's a great a launch. solid first launch. It took a few times, at least three times, it took to actually get going. Yeah. Because um, yeah. they had to, yeah. it, there's nothing worse than sitting there and the countdown gets to under 10 seconds and then they stop. You, you've got that, <laughs> it's going to go and it's yeah, not going to go. We yeah. all come back 48 hours later. Then we all came back, I think, 24 hours later. Right. First time I was there, they had singers. They had first lady at the time, Hillary yeah. Clinton. They had a huge women astronaut um, sort of colloquium. So you had all these different women astronauts from history, Sally Ride, a bunch of people there. By the third one, the time it actually went, it was like me and the janitor and a couple of other people. But, but Jerry yeah. Cobb was still there. She right. was going to see that go. Right. So let's let's talk about Jerry for a second, because you met Jerry. Jerry Cobb, of course, um, passed away earlier this year in, I think, March. Um, but you had a chance to meet her. What was she like? So Jerry Cobb, you know, is a, a very interesting person in history, as the many say, the first woman to go through anything like an astronaut test. We're using air quotes around all of this. Interesting. In and, and, and Amy's book <laughs> is really good on this. This is, this is the book to learn about it. Um, but she... Is a, she was quite a shy person, but quite driven. It's an interesting combination when somebody is almost sort of mumbling in an Oklahoma accent, right. and is, is I, my impression yes. is almost like this. I've seen videos of her where she's very low voice. Very low like, voice. But now Russia had put the first woman in space, and the best we could do would, would be second. And yeah. yet, the determination of this yeah. is what I want to do. It's an interesting balance. Somebody yeah. who. Frankly, I couldn't see doing that well in a huge public position because there was a there was a, a shy side to her. Yeah. But you never know. People sometimes rise to it. But in this occasion, she was seeing something she had dreamed about for herself. Right. You know, a quarter of a century earlier, she's finally seeing it happen. Not just a woman as a passenger on an American space flight. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Russians had had somebody who's essentially a commander on a, on a Russian space flight who's a woman because she's the only one on board. Yeah. So she yeah. has to be the commander, right? Yeah. But it was mostly automatic mission. And propaganda. Yeah. That's, that's another story. Another story. <laughs> but, but somewhere in the middle of all this, you've got this woman who is now, she's piloted the space shuttle before, and now she's going to command an American mission for the first time, exactly what Jerry wanted to do. Right. And she's there at the launch pad watching it. And yeah. so to be literally standing next to her in some of those moments was fascinating history, yeah. what if kind of moment. Yeah. And, and because you've told me the story before, but I want you to share it with my audience. Um, just describe watching Jerry that night, watching the launch and then that whole, because you described it beautifully. And since I ended up cutting this out of my book, I, want, I do want to <laughs> capture the story. And I figure I'd rather get it direct from you instead of through me. So sure. Yeah. So the first time there was going to be a launch, Everybody's there, all the VIPs, the first lady's there, um, Judy Collins sings a song. It's very much a female empowerment kind of event. By the third time they try and launch, the time it actually goes off, you're, you're down to like the real hardcore fans. You're and down to the, people who... The science teams, I imagine. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You're there, people who've managed to extend their stays, mm -hmm. people who've managed to get extra hotel nights, change their flights. They're there, they're going to see it. They're going to stay there until it goes. And Jerry was one of those people. So even though she's in the middle of a huge crowd and it's a very public thing, she's still a loner. She's still an individual. She's going to do it her way. So while everybody else, we are as close as you can be to a launch without being inside the shuttle. We are a few miles away in the VIP stands next to what is now the Saturn V building. So we're as close as you can get. There's water and then there's the pad. Right. And so she decides to go that little bit closer. You've probably seen the pictures of the stands of the countdown clock, and then there's the water. Just in front of that water, to make sure none of the lovely Florida wildlife come and eat you, yeah. there's, a, there's a chain link fence at that time. She goes down there and she puts her hands on this fence, and it's a night launch, and she holds that fence because she wants to feel the vibration of the launch through her. So there's this silhouette of this figure. As this shuttle takes off, the light comes across the water, and eventually there's that shock wave that hits yeah. you. Here's this tiny little woman standing there, feeling it, watching Eileen Collins yeah. do what she'd always dreamed about. And then comes the horrible bit. You've all got to get back on a bus, 
even though there's a lot fewer people there at that time, you've got to wait. They've been around the Earth at least once by the time you get to the edge of the Kennedy Space it's Center on that bus. It's a weird, like, that was exciting. Okay, now we have to, it's like, it's like leaving a concert. That was fun. Now we're in the parking it's lot. It's exactly like half. leaving the worst yeah. rock show parking <laughs> lot ever. And yet, Jerry's loving it. The moon is out. It's been, um, it's 1999, so it's 30 years, July, since the very first moon landing. It's a historic time to be there, and there's the moon, and now Eileen Collins is this little dot going around the Earth. And I just look at Jerry sitting in the bus, and I took a picture of this. She's got this beautific smile on her face. She is calm. She's at peace. There's a yeah. little checkbox in her head her whole life that just went, check. Right. Wasn't me, but check. Yeah. And it was nice to see. She's some, yeah. something, you could see it. She was very, very happy. Which is really nice. I mean, I, I, I love that story just because it does give her a little bit of closure yeah. in a way, sort of. I mean, she's complicated. She's a very complicated person. She's a very complicated figure to deal with. But um, So in addition to that, I mean, you, you met her. You corresponded with her. Mm -hmm. Did you, I mean, was she, how did she talk about everything? She, I ran into her in person one more time, and that was the Spaceship One launch. So back in the... Right up in Mojave, you know, Edwards Air Force Base, where the sound barrier was broken, the space shuttle first landed, all kinds of other yeah. historic aviation features. They were doing the very first commercial private launch. Virgin Galactic were doing Spaceship One. It, it got into grazed the atmosphere three times, technically was in space, and history was made. Incredible thing to be at. A very different from a shuttle launch. Yes. Shuttle launches big government. Yeah. This is like you drive up in a truck and you spend the night in your car or your truck as the gusting yeah. wind blows you around or you're in somebody's hangar. You wake up in the morning, you watch a space shot, the guy lands in front of you, walks over, shakes your hand, yeah. goes down the fence and you might go for drinks with them later. I mean, it's that. And so there she was. Yeah. So it was a much more intimate kind of thing. Right. The head of NASA showed up and watched somebody else fly in space for the first time in America, huh. which is really cool. <laughs> But that was Sean O'Keefe at the okay. time, yeah. yeah. A lot of other um, astronauts, administrators were there. Yeah. It was a really interesting time interesting, to be there. Interesting. And there's Jerry, huh. just um, enjoying it. Was she invited or did she just kind of show up? I don't know. <laughs> but what I do know is I asked her, do you want to do this? Because that was the, the moment was, okay, in a couple of years' time, everybody's going to be a passenger right, right. on these. This is coming right now. They've already done it. This is the first space tourism. Right. Uh, so I asked her, do you want to be a passenger? And she was very emphatic. She's like, nope, I want to fly the thing. I want to actually pilot the thing. Yeah. And I'm like, there's an insight into somebody who, yeah. even if they could finally do what they've been wanting to do all their life, go into space, wants to do it their way. Right. And that was very interesting. That she, she wanted to actually feel the controls. And yeah. I thought, that, that's good and bad in, in, in different ways. But yeah. I, I understood where she was coming from. Yeah, I think that, and that makes sense. I mean, everything that you read about her kind of, going through this campaign in the 60s to try to get be heard by NASA it all really does have this feeling of I I want to be it I want to open space for women but I want to be the one to do it I think that's something you capture really yeah. well in, in the drafts of your book I've read so far which is while she was doing a campaign for an American woman to become the first woman in space before the Russians yeah. Essentially, she was the prime candidate yes. at that time, yeah. and it was pretty clear that she was saying, I want to do that. Yeah. And she said some things that most people wouldn't say, like, I would go into space even if I wouldn't come back. I would give my life for this. Yeah. And while that's... I don't think even the Mercury astronaut said that. I think, because the, the famous one at the press conference is, who thinks they're going to go up and come back? And they all, you know, two hands up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody thought, well, I'm going to go and not come back. Right. <laughs> And while I understand putting your life on your line for the yes. country, this seemed to be a little bit more. This seemed to be, this is my calling. This is what I'm yeah. meant to do. And that scares me a little bit that somebody is so into something that they'd be willing to yeah. die. And I don't think that was what America wanted or needed at the time either. Oh, God, definitely not. No, that would have been a disaster for a lot of reasons, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's an interesting one. So you also mentioned that you met Wally. And I know you had a, a lot of correspondence and are still friends with Wally. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about Wally. Because I think what's, what's really interesting here, and I feel like I should maybe preface this a little bit for the, the, my, my lovely audience. Hello. Um, is that, you know, all of these women's, women, for, for each of them, this whole idea of this testing program had, they all had a different experience of it. For some of them, it was just a thing that was neat. Mm -hmm. And for some of them, they imagined that it was going to lead into space. And 
what how they interpreted it changed the way they related to it and how they related to each other and it's i mean it's a it's a it's all a rich tapestry to quote marge simpson's therapist um <laughs> so yeah wally is similar in in tone and kind of approach to jerry in that she wanted to do it she would give her life and she actually applied to the astronaut corps mm -hmm. th what three times i think so yeah um right up into the, the mid 80s i believe and mm -hmm. was you know always just like missing a requirement missing something yeah. and then too old and um so yeah tell me a little bit about meeting wally and how you came up to wally and i feel like this is where we shamelessly plug your other book which is on my desk so in the uh into That Silent Sea, that's oh, the one. Yeah. I was going to say In the Shadow of the Moon, but that's your other other book. <laughs> Into That Silent Sea. Fantastic book about early space program, kind of uh, pre-Apollo. So Mercury, Gemini days. Um, but there's a chapter in there about Wally. So tell me a little bit yeah. about meeting Wally Funk and what she's like, because I've also never spoken to her, mm. and I'd like to kind of get a feel for Oh, that. you should, yeah. Because <laughs> no, in writing Into That Silent Sea, my whole opinion on the Mercury 13 changed. Yeah. One, one is I realized the Mercury 13 the name is a 1980s media invention. Yeah. Um, they never met as a group. They, some of them yeah. died before yes. they ever got together. So the 13 women never met. They went individually yeah. through this testing. And as you just said, their idea of what it was was very different. They were told different things. I was just hearing a talk by two of them last, yeah. last week. And one of them, Sarah Ratley, said, I was told that this was a pre-astronaut training program. And I was going to be one of America's first women astronauts. Yeah. One of the other ladies, Janora Jessen, said, I knew this was a medical testing program to see whether women could pass some of right. the physical tests yeah. that male astronauts went through as an as a interesting medical experiment. Yeah. Totally different ideas. So every woman, yeah. as you say, is different, and Which everybody has a different story. So interesting, because like, as you said, these two, these two perspectives from these two women on this panel recently, um, they did the, this is them, at, they're at the exact same location, they're both at the Lovelace cl Clinic, both doing the exact same test, and they're both getting very different information. Absolutely. And I think you said it was Sarah was there when Randy Lovelace was there. If Randy Lovelace, the head of the clinic, yeah. was there, you thought you were going into space. Right. If he was out of the week, you knew you were in a medical testing yeah. program. So, Which is so interesting. Yeah, he, he crossed the line. He's, he, told, he may have hoped that these yeah. women were going to be the very first American female yeah. astronauts, but he had no position saying that. Right. But this was like the Wild West of American space program at the time. This was yeah. the early days. A lot of the decisions as to who to pick for the men was made on, were, were made on medical things. Yes. Who's the fittest? Who's the strongest? It was, yeah. But as the program started coming into formation, it was like, actually, we need pilots. We need different things. We need test pilots. Yeah. We need test pilots with advanced engineering degrees. It got yeah. very specific. So yeah. by the time you get to somebody like Neil Armstrong, he's a jet test pilot, yeah. an X-15 pilot. He's got a master's degree. And that's the second group of astronauts, we should right. say. It's, like, this is, it's not like it developed over years and years and years. This is like 50, 59 to 62. To NASA yeah. realize like we need intense engineering brains right now and then was it group five was the first uh, scientist astronaut yeah. so then it was all well, we need scientists and geologists for do all this lunar exploration stuff um so wally you so know wally, i mean yeah. wally must i don't i don't i off the top of my head don't know i should double check this insert caption um but she must have been there when randy was there because she believed that it was a real thing as well <laughs> what wally is a great example of how to deal with things with great positivity. And when you meet her, I might really, yeah. it's gonna yeah. happen. She is just a, a ball of fire. Yeah. She is an incredibly energetic woman who has been that way all her life. And you know, what happens when you've been told or you are allowed to assume that you're gonna become a one America's yeah. first women astronauts and then you realize it isn't going anywhere. Do you go back and sulk? Do you complain? Do you, what do you do? She has a great expression. She says, throw it a fish. She's like, throw it a fish. Throw it a fish, like, like it's whatever. A nope, just literally like whatever. Cast it aside. Forget about wow. it. Well, maybe not forget about it, but move on in life. Right. Take it for what it was. Okay. Don't let it eat you up, huh. and move on. And that's not to say allow yourself to fail. That's not to say don't go and campaign to change things. But don't let it kill you. You know, allow yourself to be like that was that. This isn't happening. Yeah. What else can I do? She became the first female NTSB investigator. She Which became the first cool. female yeah. FAA inspector. You yeah. know, incredibly important things. Yeah. You know, ac when a plane crashes, you need accident investigators yes. right there. You need experts. No woman yeah. had ever done that in a lead before yeah. like she did. Yeah. She went on to pioneer all kinds of stuff that. in her own yeah. way. Incredible woman and, and yeah. a great advocate. I, I did, took some flying lessons with her and which was fun. Yeah, I, I, I got to land a plane with her, the dual that's control, awesome. and she's a great instructor. <laughs> she, yeah, I, ho yeah, I really hope you get to do that yeah. too. She's, she's one of those she's people still flying, still, flying yeah. still teaching other people yeah. to fly too. Um, mostly young women who are yeah. wanting to be her. 
So <laughs> yeah. she doesn't stop. And, and yeah. it's wonderful to see. It doesn't mean you should just give up on your dreams. It means you should put them in perspective and go, you know, if this really isn't going to happen for me, it doesn't mean I can't just move everything forward right. in my own life and for everybody else's right. life. She's fun. Yeah. And as you're talking, and I, I just thought of this now, when Jerry started her whole crusade, we'll mm -hmm. call it a crusade, she was 28, 29. Wally was 21 yeah. when she first wrote to Jay Shirley and Randy Lovelace to get herself involved. The youngest one, yeah. So do you think, and I'm positing this for the first time ever out loud to you on a video, do you think her age might have had something to do with kind of her gung-ho-ness? Mm. I mean, I, I can only imagine having been both 21 and in late 20s. When something happens at that age, that kind of becomes more formative, maybe, than when you're a little bit older. Possible, except she's still like that now. Yeah, I guess. So... I just mean her, her sort of, like, you know, her diehardness of wanting to go into space, that she did apply for the astronaut program, that she does want to fly on Spaceship One, and she wanted to command it. I think you said recently that she's now going to be a passenger, mm -hmm. if she can still. Yep. But she still wants to go, that that became something that was so, so important so early in her life that it kind of created this... I don't know. I, I, interesting. <laughs> I think all of those women, including going back to World War II and yeah. the Wasps, I think everybody yeah. has that. Yeah. Sometimes there are windows that open in life. Yeah. And all of those women aviators had to push. Mm -hmm. If you were a woman in that era, thankfully a lot, so much has changed, and you wanted to fly, you had to work around your family a lot of the time. You had to work around every man who said, well, we don't have women's bathrooms at this airport, so no. Right. You can be a stewardess, that they, that's a different application, go over there. If you wanted to fly a plane, you had to have a lot of push. Yes. You had to have a lot of courage to the point yep. where you, you sometimes you had to take no for an answer, but it wasn't going to be the last answer. Yep. You were going to yeah. find a way. So people like Wally just found a way. She was yeah. going to find a way to get around all this stuff and make it happen. And when it comes to the space program, yeah. she's still pushing, like you say. She's talking with Virgin Galactic. She's got some money in there. She's got some other sponsorship. She wants to be one of the first passengers. Yeah. She, yeah. the Discovery Channel, many years ago, took her over to Star City in Russia, and she got yeah. to go in all the simulators and be a cosmonaut for a few weeks. Right. Didn't get her any further into space, but she got a really good sense of what it was right. like to train as a Russian yeah. cosmonaut. And that was great. She had a good time. The company had a good time. Made for great television. Anything like that that she can push, she right. will. And and huh. it's good. It's not just for her. It's because it's good for everybody around right, her. Right. Right. Interesting. But okay. fascinating lady. I mean, one of those yeah. people. You know, first time I, I met her, I'm like, wow, you. <laughs> you're this pioneering pilot. Yeah. And then she shows up in an RV in my driveway and stays there for a couple of weeks and stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay. So now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now we have a house guest, you know, and it was fun because, yeah. you know, who, who do you want to sit around and drink and have some stories that's about true, that, that's true. than somebody There's who's got like all these stories? Worst people I know, and I feel like this is where we have to say you're also like buddies with Al Warden, and like of all of the people that you get to hang out and drink with, like Wally Funk and Al Warden are not bad people. <laughs> no, I think I think Al would much rather drink with you than me, but Al I, is I, so delightful. <laughs> I I really enjoy. It. I got to work with yeah. him on his book Falling yes. to Earth. You know, that was on Apollo 15. Picture got to uh, hang around the moon for a few days on yeah. his own. Yeah. But most people, when they go around the moon on their own, they think, oh, that's sad. The poor isolated. Yeah. He loved it. Yeah. And, and to, I, to me, to sit down and hear what it was like to be around the moon on their own was wonderful. And I, yeah. I just, you know, I really hope that those women had got that opportunity because our current NASA administrator is saying when a woman goes to the moon and right. you realize, you know, 24 people went to the moon, all Americans, yeah. all men. Yeah. No woman has left Earth orbit yet. Yeah. And so he's making a real good point about the sure. next person on the next flight, at least one of them has got yeah. to be a woman. Just yeah. because it's about damn time, yes. you know. I like that. We will, however, shelve the discussion of Artemis or our team. I don't know how to I'm not going into. I'm not going into the politics We're side of it. I'm going that, into the gender but, politics side of it, which I'm like, whatever, whatever they fly, however it goes, I'm really glad in space. NASA is saying women's, women are going to go to yeah. the moon finally. Yeah, no, That's true. good. Beyond Jerry and Wally, you've you've emailed a bunch of the other women with varying degrees of success. Um, is there? I mean, and I don't I don't want to put you on the spot mm -hmm. about like who was maybe less fun to deal with or anything. Oh. But um, you know, what what other kind of interactions have you had with them? Because right. So when I first started writing yeah. about the Mercury Thirteen, it was the late nineties. So right. the the sad thing is many of those women have since passed away. Um, the great thing for me at that time was I was able to talk to many of them, the opportunities that now lo no longer exist. I'm not sure any of them were negative experiences, but what I realized was these women who had never met, who had been told various things about what program they were in, sometimes 
verging on lied to about what could happen in their program. They had very different ideas. And when you have these very strong-willed yeah. people, yeah. as they have all had to be, they're going to disagree. And when you have strong-willed people, they tend to disagree pretty strongly. So I was careful not to get pulled too much into their internal politics, but it was there. Right. You, you had some of the women saying, well, that woman only does this because of this. And it, and it let's got be a little, here. you it know. It was there 30 years later. Like this isn't, yeah. I can only imagine, and I've, and I've read in some of the letters that I've been able to find, how they, they talk about each other and the program. It's a little bit of a, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, 30 years later, they still have this feeling. I mean, this didn't go away for a lot of them. A lot of them, yeah, went, a lot of them died still with grievances yet settled. Yeah. What seems to be nice now is that everybody gets on and that they all still talk about Jerry with a level of respect even if That's they nice. didn't yeah. think that this was a, a, a real program or if they did or they didn't they also say well she was our leader and she was trying to do this yeah and they see that that is a a good place to be yeah which is good i mean just in terms of preserving their story and the memory it's nice to, to not have it be a memory that's gonna you know be tinged with negativity right and perpetuity because that's that's not fun but yeah that's, yeah. that's interesting the bit I really like about your book, the bit that I think you're nailing, which so many other projects get wrong, is why was NASA not allowing these women to become astronauts? Right. When you look at it from the outside, it looks like a clear case of NASA discriminating against women, saying, well, we're only going to have men. Yeah. NASA didn't actually specify gender in their criteria. However, when you look at what you had to do to become an astronaut, yes. no women were qualified. Yeah. The more I looked into this, the more I went, well, while NASA could have done some kind of social engineering and maybe as a, maybe because it was a big thing for the nation maybe they should have got into that but when you look at who could actually pilot the spacecraft at the time there were very specific requirements yes. yeah. and men were the only people who were able to do that was that nasa's fault it really had nothing yeah. to do with nasa i ended up going back yeah. another 15 or 20 years to world war ii when you had the wasps you had the wax yeah. you had some women flying combat damaged aircraft, test piloting them, making sure that yeah. very, very difficult things you were doing, you know, flying airplanes in a way that no woman had been allowed to fly before yeah. in America, proved prove themselves beyond any doubt yeah. that women could fly any plane that a guy could. The end of World War II, we get into the cozy 1950s of sort of American domesticity. Yes. Please go home and bake a cake, yes, as you bake, said. Bake all the cakes and take care of all the children that you just pop out in sequence. And while, yeah. Um, yeah, and while it led to some yeah. very tasty cakes, it meant that women got a really <laughs> it's true, crappy, yeah. crappy deal when it came to flying. Yeah. And um, all of those women and their experience were basically shunted to one yeah. side. So and it they, meant... But women were, at the time, allowed to serve in the Air Force Reserves, the Air Force becoming a separate service branch in 1947, but they were not on flight status, right. which is the weirdest thing. I don't get it. <laughs> Thank, um, thankfully, we don't messy, get it because yeah. we grew up in a very yeah. different era yeah. on the whole. That's yeah. not to say this has totally yeah. gone away, oh, but, definitely not, but there are, there are in incredible women examples, role models everywhere now in every field. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yet at that time, you know, women, you had to look back to the 1940s to see women proving themselves beyond any doubt that they could do anything the guys did. Yeah. At the end of World War II, they were sent back home, as you say, right at the worst possible time. Because yeah. this is the era of the jet is just beginning. Yeah. So right as we go from propeller planes yeah, to jets, beautiful women technology. are pushed out. Yeah, it's like this perfect time when like post-war technology, like all of this stuff was starting to feed into the early space age and there was this new rivalry that spawned a lot of this competition that led satellites and stuff. And at the same time, women are being told to go be homemakers and mothers and that's how you serve the country is by reinstating family values. And it's, and yeah, it's, it's just these two things are like happening yeah. and they can't merge. <laughs> it's frustrating. So here's NASA 15 years later, yeah. and they say, we need people with jet test experience to fly the spacecraft. Otherwise, you might want to fly the spacecraft, but you will die. Yeah. You will get in there, you'll try and operate the controls, and you will die because yeah. you need to have this experience if everything goes yeah. right, never mind if everything goes wrong. And now, what, what do all the Mercury 13 women have as experience? They have propeller plane experience. They have a lot of experience. They have as much experience as a woman is allowed yeah. in America at that time but it's not flying a test jet. Yeah. It just isn't the same. 
Yeah. So I that's mean, a very difficult one. Does that mean that NASA were discriminating? I think there's quite a big argument to say NASA had no choice but to choose the best, and it was the country's fault going back 20 yeah. years at that point yeah. that no women were allowed. I mean, you could say NASA was discriminating against like 99.9% .9 of the population because very few people had the skills that it it decided it needed at the time. I mean, Neil Armstrong is the great, the greatest example. And you know, I'll do this. The the opening scene in First Man when you're shaking around and it's a little bit nauseating, but you're in the X-15 with Neil Armstrong. I mean, this is a space plane that was launched and you know, jump in when I oversimplify. Uh, launched underneath the wing of a of a B-52, went up to near space height, some of them actually technically went into space and they got astronaut wings. And you have a control stick in your right hand, I believe it was right hand, um, for reaction controls to manipulate in space and then that goes through hypersonic flight coming back through the atmosphere and then you have control surfaces and then you go subsonic and you have to land it unpowered on a runway with skids. And the whole flight took what, I mean from launch, launch from the B-52 to landing a matter of 15 minutes? I mean, 18 minutes? These are not yep. long flights. All of that happened in the span of like 15 minutes. This is, this is like a serious amount of skill and reaction time yep. and, and like wherewithal of what's happening. I mean, this isn't something you can, you can unfortunately, like you can fly, you can fly around the world in a propeller plane and still not be able to jump into an X-15 and fly it. Yeah. And that's the reality. Yeah, the X-15 pilots, that was one of the things you may have needed to be considered yeah. by NASA because yeah. even when they were incredibly good test pilots, people landed the X-15 too hard and literally broke the back of it. Yes. One pilot died going yes. into a spin who was a very experienced pilot. Yeah. Even if you were the best in the world, you could still die in that airplane. Yeah. So you're absolutely correct. Propeller airplanes, it was wishful thinking. Yeah. You just, so what do you do? Luckily, this country eventually did the right thing. In the 1970s, women were beginning to be able to go to test pilot school. And by the 1990s, some in the 1980s, basically the first three women to come out of the military test pilot school, NASA picked all of them. One to yeah. work in mission control, the other two became um, space shuttle pilots, and one of them, Eileen Collins, got to command yeah. the first American mission yeah. commanded by a woman. So the second women were qualified yeah. coming out of the military to fly yeah. a, a spacecraft, NASA took them. I think by then too, NASA had been under a decent amount of fire to like, start being more inclusive. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that's, that's another thing that happened at the time. Yeah, you look at the 1970s, yeah. the first people that NASA chose yeah. as their shuttle astronauts, you yeah. had a lot of women, you had a lot of people from all kinds of different yeah. ethnic, diverse all of a you minorities. All diversity in the, yeah. in the astronaut corps. You look at the, the sad picture of the Challenger yeah. crew, the, the crew that died, yeah. and people use that as an example of, you know, you have women, you have an Asian person, yeah. you have an African-American person, yeah. you have all these different faces. It wasn't just white guys. Humans Space. Humans in space, Imagine yeah. That. But those women were still passengers. Yeah. They weren't pilots yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah. So it really yeah, took Eileen Collins the, the, to be the one. The distinction between this is, and this is how I think NASA was able to open it up early on. Because um, I don't know when, when did Eileen Collins, because it was a while before women were allowed in as pilots. Because they made the separation between pilots and mission specialists. And the specialists were like the scientists that were doing things that were vital, but they weren't actually like in the control or commander's seat. Um, so yeah, when, do you, I don't know. I believe, the well, the first American pilot. woman was Sally Ride in 83. Yeah, she was a mission specialist though. Yeah, absolutely, she was, she was doing the work that the shuttle was designed to do. Right. Somebody else took it up there, right. and, and then, then she actually research. did the experiments. Yeah. But in terms of flying in the front, Eileen Collins was flying as a pilot in 95. She was yeah. commanding in 99. Yeah. It took that long for this to work through the system. Yeah. So should NASA have done what Jerry Cobb answered, asked them to do, which is do a, some kind of crash program, training women. The whole thing was a crash program. Yeah. It's hard to say. Yeah. It, is yeah. it because American space program has not only ever been about qualifications yeah. and about where you go. It is a thing of national pride. Yes. There is a lot to be said for they should have allowed all kinds of different ways of other people yeah. to come in and do it. But was that their job? At that time, the president had said, moon, eight years. Now, go. Yeah. That was impossible. <laughs> you go moon now. That was impossible. And... It, how the, the fact they managed to do that, to land people on the moon and bring them home safely by the end of the decade, yeah. that is literally doing the impossible. I'm not sure we could do it now in 10 years. Doing it then in 10 years, wow. Yeah. My yeah. personal opinion. Yeah, no, but, I know, I know. And, I, and I'm not saying what I think should have happened to save that. <laughs> but it, it, it is turning out to yeah. be very difficult to do it now. Yes. So the fact that they did it yeah. 50 years ago, half a century yeah. ago, impossible. Yeah. So NASA was given that mandate. 
did they have time to do other things? Not with the budget they had, not with the directive right. they had. Should they yeah. have? That's, if only there were a really good book that looked into that. No, right? If only there were a really good book that looked into that <laughs> question and worked out what was happening. Yeah, exactly, kind of how it, it's, it's all, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna give away the ending and I'm definitely not giving away my opinion on this just yet. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a big question and it's, it can go a lot of ways. Yeah. So what's great to see, you know, just the other week, I'm sitting in an audience where two of the Mercury 13 women are on stage talking about their experiences next to Nicole Stott, who is a wonderful former NASA female astronaut, worked on the space station, yeah. done spacewalks, yeah. done watercolors in space. I mean, everything you can imagine to do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, most of us can't do watercolors or spacewalks. She yeah. just she do does both, both really well. <laughs> She's up there with them, talking about what an inspiration they were. Yeah. And in the audience, we have one of the very first women chosen to fly the shuttle. And she's then talking to them. And you just That's realize Linda there's Gawain? this... No, Linda Gondwin was there as well. I met her. Yeah, but we have Anna Fisher. Awesome. Oh, nice. Anna Fisher, the first yeah. person who defied all those 50 stereotypes you were talking yeah. about. She, she was a mother. Yeah. At the time she flew yeah. in space, became the first mother to fly in space. Yeah, yeah. You know, any idea that like, well, you should stay at home and have kids. She's like... I'll do that and fly on the space shuttle. Thank you yeah. very much. Well, and I'm watch, sitting there looking at this synergy and, you know, by the time everybody retires, the ages kind of blur and they don't yeah. seem that far apart in decades and things like that. And you're just thinking, what an incredible conversation. I'm witnessing yeah. the first, the second, the third, yeah. all these different levels. The question is now almost irrelevant, but, but yeah. what those women went through to have to push, and it still didn't happen, yeah. but they're still pushing to talk yeah. about it and there are still young girls in the audience inspired by them, and there are still retired women astronauts who are still inspired by them. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. Yeah. I'm so glad you were writing it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. I came yeah. here to see Pete the Cat. I mean, oh, that's why Pete. I'm here. Where, I know, I know. That's who the only reason Pete? I'm here. He, he's got to be... Around? I didn't mean for you to stop. I just wanted to say something stupid. Pete is big. I am tiny. <laughs> True story. Um, but you also, um, speaking of women in space and not... Pete Conrad, Not the astronaut, Pete. Um, or the cat, for that matter. Um, you worked with Sally Ride. You worked with her, and you knew her quite well. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Because she was, of course, the first American woman to fly in space, and um, she's very relevant to this discussion, and you you have experience with her. Sure. I mean, I got to meet Pete Conrad. I've got to meet Pete the cat, <laughs> and Sally Ride was my boss. Yeah. Um, I was very fortunate to be offered a job by her. Um, she was running a company called Sally Ride Science, uh, which was her post astronaut career, she could have, and did in many cases, take every high paid speaking job you could imagine, yeah. but she could have yeah. just done that. Yeah. Um, she was a name and she's in a Billy Joel song. I mean, when you get to that kind of level of famous level, you know, you, it's like Buzz Aldrin. Everybody knows Buzz Aldrin, right, even right. if you don't know anything about the space program, yeah. you know the name. Sally Ride was that. Yeah. She was a famous person. She could have just coasted on that, made a lot of money, but she decided post NASA to put back she was a first at a time when she really shouldn't have been the first. As we were talking about, why did it take till 1983, 1983, mm -hmm. not 63, yeah. until America put, the, put their first woman in space on the space shuttle? That was a long time. You know, yeah. People had been flying out of this country into space for over 20 years at that point. Mm -hmm. So she didn't want anybody else to have to wait as long as she did until there was a first. And so she started this company, which is still going, um, where they really aim at middle school girls. And that's the age that she did a lot of research and she realized that's the age that girls begin to drop out of science and technology. Yeah, and I, I know that anecdotally from teachers and friends of mine, friends of mine with kids at that age that they, yeah, that's when girls start to like, you love science, you love all this stuff, and then grade eight, it just goes down. And it's peer pressure. They, they, the, yeah. the studies that she did and, and other studies that she looked at said, you know, in elementary school, every kid's like, oh, I want to know this, I want to know yeah. that. You try doing that with a high school group of kids. Right. It's all, you know, you, you know right. this, they know this, everybody knows yeah. this. But somewhere in middle school where the boys and girls really separate on that. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time you get to the level where they're starting to choose college, it's almost too late, which is why you see so fewer girls going into science and engineering in yeah. college than boys. Yeah. That plus all kinds of societal expectations yeah. that girls maybe not be doing that as much as boys. It, it's terrifying. I, I cakes. Bake cakes. I also go to school. <laughs> you, you th we we kind of joke yeah. about it, but yeah. I've I've sat down with kids and I've said, draw me a picture of a scientist, and it is an old white guy with a bald head and big bushy white sides, yeah. hold, wearing a white lab coat, holding a test tube yeah. in a basement on their own. Now, yeah. I mean, that's what kids draw yeah. now more than any that's other really picture. Sad. You ask a, a a young girl 
hey, do you want to be an old white guy who's bald sitting in a basement <laughs> on their own? No. It's, it's the furthest thing they want to be, yeah. and that's what they see a scientist being. Huh. So what Sally Wright did was really invest a lot of her time, the rest of her life essentially, into reaching those middle school girls and trying to get them through that time. Yeah. And she went, well, what do middle school girls like? They like to be social. They yeah. like music. They like festivals. Yeah. They like big public events. So she put on these big festivals around the country where the girls would go and go, hey, this is what science is. There are 700 of my peers here. There's music going on. There's yeah. hands-on science experiments. There's Sally or another female astronaut giving a great talk. They went, yeah. if I thought science was this solitary, boring profession, yeah. apparently not, because this is science. Yeah. It was really clever. So awesome. she was really interesting to work with. Hmm. As a person, really interesting too, because when you get to that level of fame, you have to be really careful. Just like any rock star, just like any media person, you get, Can you, imagine? you get a lot of weird yeah. stuff. And if you're a woman, sadly, there's another level of strangeness that comes at you. And so she had layers around layers around layers of protection um, people. Not talking about security, though that was there sometimes, right. but we were all trusted in ways that were never really even said. Yeah. You just sort of knew how to deal with people, where to, where to get her to and from places, and how to protect her from some of that stuff in her workplace, at these festivals. And you realize that she's putting herself out there in a way that many guys would never even have yeah. to think about, which again, made me respect yeah. her a lot. Because it was quite a conundrum. She was a very intensely private person, particularly in her, her own private social right. life. Nobody knew what she was actually like at home. The general public never had any idea. And that was deliberate. You know, she, was, she had a public persona that she was the vanguard of getting girls into STEM fields. Right. And that is what you saw, and that's what she gave. But that was a lot of energy. And she managed to do that while keeping her own personal life very personal. Yeah. And it was really impressive yeah. to see that happen. Very interesting person. Interesting. Shy person, not the kind of person you'd think to put themselves out there like that. But she believed in it so much, that's what she did. Nice. I've got to admit, if I had come out of the space program and somebody had said, you can do whatever you want, you can be the head of NASA, you can, yeah. we'll throw millions at you just to endorse yeah. things, I may not have gone, I'm going to go dig into some research and, like and yeah, yeah it, it, it's pretty admirable that she spent the rest of her life doing that. <laughs>